Oh my god, I am eight days away till the launch of Escaping Demons. Have you seen this proof? It is right here. Aha, here it is. If you have followed my channel, you may have seen the February, why February sank. <laughs> And so you'll know that this book was originally a YA book called The Haunting of Paradise House and I decided to unpublish it. I wrote and published the second one and I took that down and this series, I have given it such a deep rewrite and rebrand that now even the tenses have been rewritten to first person from third and it's just, it's, it's very different. The stakes are different, the book is different, so this launch is now a new adult also, so this launch is just like, oh, here we go again, and I'm so excited, I'm so excited, I'm so much more happy with the book as well, with the series, I'm currently working on the next free novelette on the villain, and then I will work on the last book in the series, the fourth and last book, but anyway. Before we begin, I have a few thanks to give. First, I would like to thank GC Harris for asking me to be a guest blogger on his website. I will have the link down below. And his book called The Nine is so exciting. I am so excited to read this book because I am a long, long time standing for years I have an obsession with the Inferno, with Dante Alighieri, and I even went to Florence to find Dante's death mask. And I have a copy of the Inferno, the Divine Comedy, over here. So G.C. Harris's book is an urban fantasy which deals with the nine circles of hell. I am so stoked to read it. I will get around to it, and I will tell you how it goes. So, yes. Link in the description down below. Check out his website, check out his book. And again, thank you so much for asking me to be a guest blogger on your site. And finally, the next thank you I want to give is to Courtney Cannon at Fiction Atlas Press. She and I have put together a release giveaway to celebrate the launching of Escaping Demons. Banner. <laughs> and I am giving away some cool prizes, paperback copy of Escaping Demons, as well as this beautiful leather owl journal you see on the picture, and a winged pentacle necklace from the show Supernatural, as well as a Ouija board. How cool is that, right? So make sure you go to the link down in the description down below so that you can try to win these amazing prizes. Duh. And before I begin, make sure that you like and subscribe to my channel, duh, because you know you're gonna keep wanting to watch videos. I do give some helpful tips and at least like the video so that you can help the algorithm, you know? Thanks, guys. <laughs> and for the topic, five elements that make urban fantasy, urban fantasy, a beginner's guide. I thought this topic was really fitting because when I first wrote The Haunting of Paradise House, I was just writing a story that I had inside me and I wanted to tell. So I wasn't hitting the market. I mean, it was urban fantasy, but it lacked certain tropes. They were there, but now with the rewrite, they're stronger, I feel. So what is urban fantasy? Well, like the name says, Fantasy in an urban setting. This is usually a big city. Think New York, London, LA, even Miami, like in my book. And it's like the hustle and bustle of the city, the beat and the rhythm, the noises, the cat calls, the everyday job and traffic with an element of magic. And it usually involves whether it's mages and actual magic or they're werewolves and there's vampires and there's these things of fantasy hidden away 
in the urban setting. It doesn't always have to be a big city, but it's usually the common setting that is put into an urban fantasy novel or series. I do want to add that you can write a fictional city. This is done very, very often. Think Storybrooke from Once Upon a Time. Storybrooke doesn't exist, but it's okay because even everybody there knows that Storybrooke doesn't exist. <laughs> well, at least if you haven't seen it, then you don't know what I'm talking about, but at least after the curse is broken, they realize, oh shit, <laughs> we're not really on the real world map, are we? But even, even if that's not the case, you can still take an urban setting and make it a fictional town and it's still urban fantasy. As long as you have humans around who don't all have magic, it's not very common thing, that usually falls under the setting. The next thing I want to discuss is usually not said, I think, in many blogs and really talked about, but this is what, how do I say, it, it's very common in these books that your characters have what I call flavor, some sort of sass, attitude. We're talking, if it's young adult, then a 16 to 17 year old, they may have attitude, they have their own opinions, and they kind of like think they know everything. Do you know any 16 or 17 year olds like that? Bring the realness to your book. If it's new adult, then when we're talking college age, they still think they know everything. <laughs> Just give them some attitude, some wittiness. Don't worry if you are not that witty in your writing. Just keep it down to earth. You know what I'm saying? Just keep it down, keep it real. This is just a real big thing in the genre that characters do this. My books aren't over the top with it. Some other books are a lot wittier and I wish I could write like that. But my characters, my main character Addison, she does have an attitude, but she's not as witty as like, let's say Tori in Annette Marie's Gilded Codex series, for instance. But it's okay. It's still urban fantasy. It still fits the tropes and all that. You want to bring your characters to life with how they would actually interact in a given situation that they may not agree with or the way that they may flirt and poke fun at even like a love interest or a crush. If you've watched the Umbrella Academy, think about the interactions that the siblings have with each other and they're not all nice to each other. Actually, they're all a bunch of jackasses to each other, really. <laughs> but it's fun. It's fun to watch keep the banter. Think also Sam and Dean in Supernatural. The next one I want to mention is that strong female lead of an MC. <laughs> you know the one. Usually in most of the books you'll pick up in urban fantasy, the main character is a female. She has a strong lead and she knows what she wants and she's not always the damsel in distress type. She's kind of the one that will like go after the baddie on her own even though she knows it's probably not a good idea. And if she doesn't have magic, she definitely knows it's a bad idea, but she does it anyway. And sometimes it's to save her love interest instead of the other way around. This is very common. This is a very common trope in urban fantasy. Now, there are urban fantasy books with a male character and I want to read more of those, but there aren't as many as the female lead character. Should you write one with a male character and go for it? Hell yeah. In fact, one of the next books I'm gonna write has a male lead because, you know, why not? but it is more common to see the female lead character. So don't be surprised if you pick up 10 and one of them has a male character as the main character and the rest are all female. It's just a thing. The fourth thing, <laughs> thing <laughs> is one that I had to practice is the common POV of the book. 
and that is usually in first person. More than likely, it's first person past, but many times it is first person present. My Castilian Blood series, I have written in first person present. I know a lot of people don't like it, but I feel that it really drags you in and puts you into the moment, in the eyes of the character. When I first started The Haunting of Paradise House, it was in third person. This is not a common UF trope, so I was very happy to have to, um, well, I wasn't happy to have to rewrite it. <laughs> that would be a lie, but I am happy that I did, and now it fits better, and it's easier to read, and it was it's easier to write, and it feels better. This is a common thing in urban fantasy. POV, first person POV. And last but not least, number five, the steam. And I don't mean steampunk. No, I'm talking about, even though steampunk, you can uh, add that into your UF novel, but no, I'm talking about the steaminess, the sizzle, the sexiness of your novel. This does not have to be over the top. You do not have to write out sex scenes, literally, if you don't want to, but it is expected depending on your scenario. My series, it is not marketed to be a paranormal romance, but it has some paranormal romance in it. So book one doesn't have it, however, book two will. I've already written it, it does, but you'll see later when it comes out. But typically, there is a love interest of some sort. So there should be lust in a way, a bare leg, a sexy dimple or two, or something that makes the reader also lust for what your character is lusting after. And usually, this involves a werewolf or a vampire or a reaper, like in my book. Examples! <laughs> okay, for examples, I want to talk about the Guild Codex series. Oh my god, these books are so good. It's definitely a break from my writing because I'm more kind of doom and gloom sometimes. Not always, but you know, it's a lot more serious than hers. Hers are so witty and funny. I love them. Oh my god, I want to live in that world. But anyways, in the Guild Codex, book one, three mages and a margarita, Tori moves into a very busy hustle and bustle town and she is broke and looking for a job. Only one problem, she has a badass temper and she gets fired literally every freaking where she works because she cannot hold her tongue. And she gets this mysterious uh, paper floating around and it leads her to a job where she walks into a guild. But she doesn't know it's a guild and her temper gets the best of her. She ends up throwing a margarita <laughs> at an also oh handsome but kind of a jerk off mage. And boom, we have the first magical moment. Not at the moment, but she will learn very soon, very quickly that, yeah, she just uh, threw a margarita at a very powerful mage. Each book has a mystery involvement to it and she ends up proving that she is a badass and saving the guy. Sorry, was that a spoiler? Oh crap, I think it was. Well, it's more about the journey. Yeah, so the next example is Sarah Cannon's Sacrifice Me, where the main character, Frankie, is also broke, college age, new adult, looking for a job, and she walks into Lo and Behold, and I am holding out on spoilers, so if you want to read the book, I'm being on my behavior now walks into a bar <laughs> where she ends up getting a job in. This is very common in UF, the whole bar thing, okay? And she walks into a magical world 
her love interest is a vampire. Oh, Tori's love interest was a uh, magical person as well. So, yeah. Examples. Magic in a busy city, and we have the character tropes being broke, being tough, female leads, and looking for a job. So you're starting to see a pattern here. My third example is my book because I'm recording this video, so why not? <laughs> In Escaping Demons, my main character, Addison, is also broken looking for a job. <laughs> but she does not become a bartender. Why? Because she wants to be a nurse. And she is waiting for a nursing program to open up and in the meantime, she wants a position having to do with her field because she doesn't want to be a bartender. She wants to start getting experience right away. A mysterious phone call lands her a job away from the very busy hustle and bustle of Miami to care for an older man as a living nurse in the Florida Keys in Tavernier. When she goes in, she realizes this is not such a normal job and there's magic and demons and ghosts and a bunch of other crazy shit. She's tough, she sticks up for herself, she beats demons' asses and she saves the day, that kind of shit. Her love interest is the reaper who is there waiting for someone to die. Trying to be really good with the spoilers. But anyways, you see the pattern. So in all three examples, we have the strong female lead trying to save herself or the world. We have the urban setting with magic and we have the romance that has to do with a reaper, a mage or a vampire walks into a bar, probably. And they're all written in first person point of view. Now I can go on and on and on forever on what makes urban fantasy urban fantasy, but those were just five things with some examples. And I really hope that this gives you a clearer picture if you want to try to write one yourself. I hope you enjoyed this video and please give it a thumbs up. Hit that little notification bell and subscribe if you haven't. My name is Killian Wolf and I will see you in the next video. Bye guys. Shine.